Thank you for sharing my work of um, that of myself and my supervisors as part of my MPhil research entitled the process optimization for the production of activated carbon using waste coconut shell in Trinidad and Tobago. I am from the process engineering department at the University of Trinidad and Tobago. So a background to my work Large volumes of produced water are currently generated from the oil and gas sector in Trinidad and Tobago, which has phenol, this contaminant phenol, in excess of the legal or safe discharge limits of 0.5 milligrams per liter. The problem with this phenol is that high costs are incurred by organizations when they have to pay contractors to dispose of this water, of this produced water, and this limits the reuse of the produced water on site. Globally, the technique of activated carbon adsorption of phenolic compounds has proven to be very successful. However, its use in Trinidad and Tobago is limited because it has to be imported. It is expensive and there are challenges posed by the scarcity of foreign exchange. So if a regenerative activated carbon adsorption column could be designed using an adsorbent made from indigenous or local raw materials, this would reduce the costs um, due to the activated carbon having to be imported and also the costs incurred by companies to pay for the disposal of their water and will allow reuse of the produced water on site. So preliminary work was conducted by myself and my supervisors, which was presented at the International Conference on Sustainability Science and Engineering in Malaysia in 2019, which showed that the waste coconut shell that is abundantly available in Trinidad and Tobago could be successfully converted to activated carbon. Now, to make activated carbon, in summary, you first have to carbonize the coconut shells in an inert environment, followed by the activation stage. Now, the art of making an effective activated carbon lies in how you control the conditions of the activation process, such that the burn-off, which is the allowable loss of the product from carbonization known as the char, this burn-off must be maintained at around 25 to 40% to yield a microporous activating, activated carbon based on previous studies. So the activation temperature and time was established in this preliminary study to be 900 degrees Celsius at 10 minutes. Therefore, with ongoing process optimization, the intent of this particular presentation or study is to investigate the effect of the activating agent, which is carbon dioxide, on the development of the micropores and therefore enhanced phenol adsorption. So besides aiming to produce a microporous type activated carbon, which could remove at least 75% phenol from the produced water and by extension, industrial effluent and vary any carbon dioxide fluoride to establish maximum adsorption capacity of the adsorbent. I, we also aim to establish the appropriate adsorption isotherm model that best fits the phenol adsorption data. Now an isotherm model basically quantifies the amount of the adsorbed species, in this case phenol, its distribution between the liquid and solid phases once um, equilibrium with adsorption has been reached. It also establishes the maximum adsorption capacity of the adsorbent. So here you could see how coconut, uh, I mean this is a familiar site us locally with the dumping of coconut. Um, shells. So I already spoke about the carbonization followed by the activation. As I said before, activation, the conditions of activation must be controlled in such a way to ensure microporosity is achieved. 
Once the product is made, it is allowed to cool and then washed with the ionized water until the washings have a pH of seven. Followed by the isotherm modeling, which I did at five degrees Celsius and 85 degrees Celsius. Note that previous isotherm, that isotherm modeling was conducted previously for 25 degrees Celsius in the preliminary study that was presented at the ICOSC in Malaysia. I also used scanning electron microscopy to give a detailed picture of the pores that were developed in the activated carbon product, which will, we will see later on. So this table basically presents some of the two, the common two parameter and three parameter isotherm models, which are used to describe the adsorption behavior of phenol onto activated carbon. For example, the Frunlich isotherm model, as well as the Redlich, Peterson, and Sips models, they are similar as they assume that adsorption occurs in a heterogeneous surface through a multi-layer mechanism. And there is a factor N, a parameter N, that takes into account the surface heterogeneity. Usually when N takes a value of between one and 10, adsorption is considered satisfactory. So here are the results of my study. I found that as carbon dioxide flow increased, the burn off percentage increased as well as the amount of phenol removed. So at the maximum carbon dioxide flow rate studied, which was 128 milliliters per minute of flow, I got about 12% phenol removed using a mass of 1.75 grams of activated carbon, which correlated to about 23.25% burn off. This was maximum burn off at maximum flow rate. I studied the adsorption at different temperatures, as I mentioned previously, and I found that as temperature increased, the amount of phenol removed by the activated carbon increased as well. This could be due to chemisorption taking place, and chemisorption is usually um, postulated by two theories, which could be due to phenol-phenol interactions and esterification reactions taking place between the OH group of the phenol molecule and the surface acidic groups on the activated carbon. However, this, could only, this theory could only be validated by further kinetic and thermodynamic analysis. The results of the isotherm modeling showed that the SIPS model fitted the data best at five degrees Celsius. I put the data obtained for the 25 degrees Celsius that was conducted previously in the preliminary study. And at 85 degrees Celsius, the Frunlich model fitted the data best. Now, the important takeaway from the isotherm models is the values of K, which is known as the equilibrium constant or the binding constant, which gives an idea of how strongly the phenol binded onto the activated carbon. In both cases, for both models, you could see that the values were relatively low, with more, very much less than one. And N as well, which accounted for the surface heterogeneity. And the values were very low as well, below one. And I said before that once the values are greater than one, adsorption is satisfactory. So here we could see that the binding of phenol onto the disactivated carbon that I made was relatively weak. These are the photos obtained from the scanning electron microscopy. We could see in sample A, which was the greatest, which was the highest flow rate of carbon dioxide, which accounted for 12% phenol removal. We could see a larger volume of pores developed here as compared to sample B, which was at the lower end of the um, range for the carbon dioxide flow rate which were only translated to 4.4% phenol removal. So as I said before, the SIPS isotherm modeled the data best at five degrees 
And this model assumes that there are no adsorbate-adsorbate interactions taking place. In other words, there were no phenol-phenol interactions taking place. And the Fronlich model gave the best fit for the 85 degrees Celsius. So both models fit in the data can lead one to deduce that the adsorption is thought to occur on a heterogeneous surface from multilayer adsorption mechanism. So the pore size, the pore sizes developed in this activated carbon range from 0.5 micrometers to 4 micrometers by account of the SCM micrographs. And I spoke about the fact that chemisorption could possibly be taking place due to the phenol-phenol interactions and the reactions between the phenol and surface acidic groups. But a further kinetic and thermodynamic analysis must be done to validate the above. So in conclusion, I found that with increasing carbon dioxide flow, the burn-off percentage increased, and hence the quantity of phenol removed. However, larger carbon dioxide flows need to be studied in an attempt to achieve the target of 75% phenol removal. So once the process is optimized successfully and an effective product is made, this would provide an environmentally sustainable method for disposing of large quantities of waste coconut shell a local alternative to the use of imported activated carbon in the area of water wastewater treatment and will allow for reuse of produced water and industrial wastewater on site. And this aligns well with the TT Vision 2030 National Development Strategies in the area of waste management and sustainability. So this is just a flowchart showing where I have reached in this work, I still, so I'm currently engaged in process optimization and I plan to move, move along with studying the effect of pH and phenol removal, performing the kinetic and thermodynamic analysis, improving on product washing, characterizing the type of product made, performing a desorption study, and in the end, with all the data gathered from all the previous studies, a regenerative adsorption unit would be able to be designed using this locally made activated carbon. That could help reduce the imports of activated carbon and allow for, for example, the produced water to be reused on site and increase cost savings to the companies in the oil and gas sector. These are some of my re main major references and a glossary of the terms used. And I thank you very much for your attention and I welcome any questions at this point. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Wahid, for your nice presentation about uh, activated carbon and from locally procured uh, coconut shell. So now it's open for question. I am seeing one question from Mr. Ron Mahavir. I think this is a brilliant idea of using a naturally and locally sourced commodity to help with industrial waste purification. Any idea on the volume of coconut shells needed to meet the industrial needs in Trinidad? I know this is not the focus of your study, but it does fit into the national sustainability goal, as you mentioned. Yes, it does feed into the national um, sustainability goals, but I am still presently trying to um, gain, gain an um, idea of the, the coconut shells that is available locally via research. And I also need to send out questionnaires like to companies to get an idea of, of their need for activated carbon um, locally. So it is ongoing work, um, but from what I could see, remember this activated carbon was made on, on such a small scale using a small furnace. Um, usually one kilogram of coconut shell would give about um, 220 grams of activated carbon product. But with the process optimization that is ongoing, 
I should be able to increase the amount of product yielded from the one kilogram of um, activated carbon for effective um, phenol removal. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. White. Um, yeah. Doctor, I have one or two questions. Yeah. Uh, first question is, have you made any comparison uh, using the activated car carbon that you develop using the coconut shell to what is being sold, any other activated carbon that has been sold on the market? Yes. So this was the very first piece of lab work I did in, in laying the um, preliminary studies before going forward with this work. I um, use an activated carbon. I can't remember the name right now. I think it's Fluca. Yeah, that um, removed up to 95% of the phenol from um, synthetic samples. And I found that about 0.2 grams of that would remove about 95% of the phenol efficiently. But as a way to compare what I am presently making, so my, my work thus far with what I have been making show that about 5.5 grams of my product could remove up to 70% of the phenol thus far. This was what was presented at the ICOSI in Malaysia, the preliminary work. Okay. So that is uh, why I need to optimize the process to reduce this mass as best as possible. Okay. The, the second question is, what is the cost involved? Okay, so the, the cost that I determined was basic, so far was basically um, based on the piece of equipment I use in a lab to colonize this one kilogram of um, coconut shell to yield about 220 grams of product in terms of like utilities consumption. So I, I found it worked out to about three US dollars with just the power consumption, electricity costs so far to make, to carbonize one kilogram of shell to yield about 220 grams of product thus far. Right, so if you have to sell your produce activated carbon, how much you'll be selling it for? Well, um, I'm, I'm not sure, sure yet. I would get a better idea of that once I finish off with the process optimization studies do more studies into the availability of the raw material, acquiring the raw material, all these things. Okay. Thank you stuff. very much. Sorry, I did not give you my name, Rafi Hussein from UWI <laughs> Chemical Engineering. I realize from your voice. So. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Wahid. Uh, if anybody is having any question, they can directly email to Ms. Wahid.